disordered mind, a phantom, a spirit, a ghost. For ten years, the secret of Perigord Cemetery has remained a mystery. Now, three innocent people are about to discover the ultimate evil. You think that when you die, you go to heaven? <laughs> You come to us. We've got to warn people. This summer, the ball is back. Phantasm 2. It's only a dream. It's a dream. No, it's not. Rated R. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Pod and the Pendulum, the show that covers horror movie franchises one movie and one episode at a time. This week, the ball is back, and so are we. I am your host, Mike Snoonian. And let's welcome back one of our regular co-hosts to the show. You've read her works on uh, Dread Central and Daily Grindhouse, among others. She's a frequent contributor to The Losers Club, the best and only Stephen King podcast you really need in your life. Um, And there are some tremendous ones, but I think The Losers Club is far and away the best. Please welcome back Miss Rachel Reeves. Rachel, how are we? Oh, man, I am so excited to boogie down with you guys today (laughs) and talk about this incredible film um, because what a treasure. We're so blessed. Are you more excited for because you chose Phantasm and we were just talking off air. Uh, Spoiler for our listeners. This is where Rachel and I's knowledge and of the franchise ends like we have not seen the others. So are you more excited for this than the first one? Well, it's just different. Like, I think that the first one is genuinely like a great movie in a lot of ways. And Mm -hmm. then but this one is just so just bananas and just it's just a lot. So it's just so fun in a different way. Yeah. So I'm excited to talk about that. (laughs) This is this is late 80s horror in a nutshell right here. So, yeah. But we have another guest today. We want to welcome back from the Dead Letter Movie Pod. You've heard him and we covered our Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. He's also guested on Psychoanalysis whenever we need to bring in someone to talk David Lynch. Let's welcome back Andrew Fabry to the show. Andrew, how are we? Doing great. So I'm excited to talk about this one. So I want to get our initial thoughts on this movie. Um, like the first time we watched it, what sort of special place that it has for us. So, Andrew, as our, our guest tonight, why don't you kick things off and tell us when you first encountered Phantasm 2 and why this movie, uh, why you enjoy this one. All right. Um, so uh, uh, early 2000s, um, uh, weirdly about the time I was getting into David Lynch. So this may have helped it i don't, I don't know um it's whole not making sense ethereal banana stuff may have been like i may have been prepared for it at that point mm-hmm. but around the same time that's when i first found the first movie and 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 i was working at the video store and i just slowly went through all four of them that existed at the time and so when two came, when i when i got to two i always thought of this one as the anti mike one i mean mm-hmm. no offense to <laughs> to mr legro but like this I, I'm probably not the only one who thinks of it that way. It's like the the non mic, um, and I don't know. I've always kind of like dug the franchise the, the franchise as it is because it's just so weird. It's so 
of its own uniqueness that it's hard to describe a one of those like film guides that i bought years ago described it as the only franchise that lives up to the phrase horror science fiction fantasy Mm -hmm. and it's like literally all of those things and it is exactly all of those things and uh, my first car was a hearse and so all the like hearse (laughs) stuff in these movies is you know really you know warms my heart and so i i have to ask how did you procure a hearse as your first car oh the internet um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I sold it on the internet later. So mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a, yep. Did anyone, did people avoid taking rides with you? Were you like. No, no. The, uh, w- one time I put a bunch of hay in the back and had kind of my own little haunted <laughs> hay ride. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, the thing is you just become the friend with the truck. Was it an night. open top hearse? Mm-hmm. Like, was no, it a. No, no, no. Okay. No, no, there was, it was enclosed. I just put a little bit of hay in the back and they just looked out the, the windows you could see <laughs> okay. out. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just an enclosed truck at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, when, yeah, it's like, hey man, I need some help moving something. Like, fine. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all okay. it comes down to. Although it was about the era of hearses that are in these movies. So it's like mid 70s. And so there was, it's very large. It weighed like six tons. So yeah, it's, six it's tons. a pretty big honk and it was pretty yeah it was all metal and it was Mm -hmm. so the fact that they get the hearse to go as fast as it does is one of those (laughs) things that kind of hurts the believability for me Mm -hmm. because i'm like it's not going ever that fast so it's Uh, not the interdimensional dwarfs or the flying orbs the non-jawas yeah (laughs) right it's the hearse goes too fast okay yeah totally yeah (laughs) just making sure okay yeah like that's unbelievable all right Uh, rachel how about yourself so I haven't seen this in a long time, but yeah, I heard about this same way I heard about the first Phantasm, just through friends, somebody who had told me like, you know, and when I was really starting to get into my horror movie fandom, I was like, oh, you got to see Phantasm. And so same group of friends watched it as a group, which was like the perfect way to see this movie. Uh, but then I hadn't revisited it for so long and... I am sure that there was some imbibing going on at that movie of various sorts. So I, yeah, a lot of stuff I did not remember. So this was Mm -hmm. like seeing it with fresh eyes all over again. And Mm -hmm. I'm so glad I did. Um, Because, yeah, forgot about a lot of things. And it's just, yeah, blew me away yet again. (laughs) Excellent. So it was a fun rewatch. It wasn't like one of those. Absolutely. I have regrets. Okay. Nope. No regrets. So. I remember like seeing the TV spot for this movie as a kid and it was like, you had the classic, is it Don Pardo? Look who did the movie trailers like in a world. But I remember like the voice of movie trailer gods basically being mm-hmm. like the mm-hmm. ball is back <laughs> and like 12 year old, 13 year old me being so excited for this. Like, Oh my God, the ball is back and having no idea what, the ball was having no idea that there was like a phantasm one, but all I knew it was back. And like that flying orb looks so freaking cool. And then seeing like anger scrim for the first time in commercials as the tall man being like, I need to see this movie. I did not get to see it in theaters, but at some point early on, like rented it on VHS. And I remember like thinking it was pretty awesome and thinking that the tall man was terrifying and like, really like being scared of the yellow goop that came mm-hmm. out of everybody like that is like because it wasn't blood it was like this yellow almost paint and for some reason that made it even scarier um i had not watched this movie in decades like literally since i watched it as a kid so getting to revisit it for the show was a lot of fun um I did not remember a single thing about this movie except for the brief scene where like Michael and his and Liz and Liz are slamming the doors behind them and the ball keeps crashing through the doors. Like hmm. that was like maybe the one thing I remembered about this movie, like nothing else stuck with me. It had been that long since I'd seen it. So this was a really fun rewatch. Like I don't, I think I do appreciate the first Phantasm more because it's just so creative and out there. Um, But as like a slice of late 80s horror Velveeta, it does not get much better. (laughs) Like this literally has everything, including one of the greatest hats in horror movie history. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I'd like to think it's, well, we'll talk about it, but I'd like to think it's the one thing that Reggie rescued from the flaming wreckage that contained his like family's remains. Like he runs back in and gets the boogie down hat. His Indiana Jones fedora moment. Yeah. Oh, love yeah. it. So, so let's talk a little bit about the background of this movie and I'll try to whip through this cause I don't want to be the one talking for like 30 minutes here, but, um, terms of like it's a pretty fascinating backstory for this one like after the success of phantasm don coscarelli is pretty eager to not get pigeonholed and i think it's kind of easy to forget that phantasm was his third movie and that the other two movies he made before that were kind of like family dramas and comedies um he doesn't want to get pigeonholed as a horror director and he doesn't go like too far from the genre. Like he does like a sword and sorcery epic, the beast master uh, from in 1982. I have never seen this. And Andrew, I how, see you how smiling. Have you not? So tell me about this guys. Tell me what I'm missing here with the beast master. Okay. Remember like, I don't know. in like the mid, like I want to say like mid late nineties, the Shawshank Redemption was on TBS and TNT yep. all the time. That used to be the beast master. Really? Yeah. I don't like, know how I missed I this. I feel like I only, I, I never saw it properly. I've only ever seen it on TBS and TNT, so it's probably edited for television, but it's, it's something. Um, mm-hmm. It is, if you imagine an 80s non Arnold sword and sorcery movie, and this is exactly it. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's a great, Vinegar Syndrome has a great 4K release of it. They would. If you want to just like go all in and just do it right. (laughs) And didn't they like... Do I need a 4K release of this movie? I I mean, yeah. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) Wasn't there like some special thing about that? Like Coscarelli like asked people to like for elements or something, like put out a thing about it if I, or am I misremembering? Oh, no, I mean that... I wouldn't put it past it. You know, I think that there was something about, yeah, I think that there was something about it that it was like an unforeseen, like full cut or something. Okay, yeah, 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 of course. In, in typical vinegar syndrome style, you're going to get more Beastmaster than you can handle. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's like three movies, three, four Beastmaster movies. I don't know. I saw like, there was a few others. I, I did see that there were sequels and it does come out at a time where like there are, these like sword and sandal movies, like it's coming off the heels of like Conan, the barbarian uh, and clash of the Titans. Both of those movies are much larger hits than Beastmaster. Um, clash of the Titans does like 42 million Be- uh, Conan does about 70 million compared to like 14 and change for uh, the Beastmaster. It doesn't quite break 15. So he decides, you know, the best thing to do is maybe return to his most loved property and the one that was successful. And he starts working on Phantasm too. Now, as he's doing that universal studios is trying to expand their uh, forays into horror, like being the original studio that like horror put them on the map. They figure now is a good time to get back in the game here. Um, And franchises are pretty much in demand due to the commercial success of like a nightmare on Elm street, Friday the 13th, I mean, you go in the 80s, I think there's one year, I think maybe 1982 is the only year that decade that there doesn't have either a Friday the 13th or an Elm Street movie released in it. Um, Because there's a year between part two and part three of Friday the 13th. And then the Freddy movies are like basically released in quick succession from, uh, from 84 through 89. So... They're looking at, they're driven by uh, a studio executive, Jim Jacks, who saw a lot of value in the horror genre and saw the the commercial appeal of it and that it didn't take a lot of investment uh, to make these movies. So Universal goes on like an IP spree in the late 80s. They pick up the rights to Halloween and you get like the successful return of Michael Myers with the return of Michael Myers and Halloween part four in 1988, same year this comes out. You get the sequels to Psycho. Uh, They pick up Child's Play after Mm -hmm. MGM uh, drops the franchise. And um, I'm trying to think of their... Oh, and they pick up Phantasm as well. They pick up the rights to Phantasm. So it's interesting because Universal, they're not developing any of their own properties, but they're finding ones that are already have been successful and they're picking them up. And you could kind of argue that 
everything they've picked up is kind and maybe with the exception of child's play, uh, which had only had the one movie before it, they're kind of picking up movies like past their expiration date. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of hard to replicate the success of the uh, earlier entries. Um, Universal gives Coscarelli three million in a negative pickup deal, basically saying, "You make the movie, we'll reimburse you three million bucks, and we'll be the ones that distribute it." Um, fun fact: at three million bucks, it's the highest budgeted movie of any of the Phantasms. <laughs> it is ten times the budget of the first movie, and I think you do see every dollar of that. Like oh, yeah. they stretch, even for eighties money they stretch that $3 million out as far it can, as it can go. Like it's impressive what they get for the money here. Um, it's also the lowest budget of any universal movie throughout the whole 1980s. Like not just horror, but like any universal studio movie, it's like the lowest wow. budget of anything. So yeah, it doesn't cost a lot to make these. Hence, like it's usually a pretty safe investment. I mean, you kind of have to go out of your way to lose money. Uh, with horror a lot of times especially in the 80s um because they pick up this movie universal does have some say in things and they have a couple mandates number one they want a female co-lead this time around they don't want it to just be michael and his brother and their best friend they actually want to bring like more women into the audience as well. They want to see it represented on screen. And with that, like the love interest stories as well, which are interesting here. Um, they also also make the request like they want a more straightforward movie. Uh, they don't want to have like that nightmare feel of the first movie where it's very difficult to tell what is reality and what's a dream. They want a more traditional narrative here. Um, and you kind of lose the nightmare feel that the first one had here. They also want to replace both Reggie Bannister and Michael Baldwin with professional actors. Cause in the years between the two movies, um, Bannister had become a mortician. Like he was no longer working in film. I don't think Baldwin had done anything since they weren't working actors and universal said, we really want to get some names on board to give it a more professional feel. So, Bannister auditions for his role and they do keep him. And I think Coscarelli really went to bat for Reggie. Um, not as much Michael. And it was nothing personal. It was more like, if I don't do what they say, this movie's not going to get made. So it's a pretty hard decision to make. Um, I have a quote here. And I, I want to give a shout out to Dustin McNeil, uh, the author who has written or co-authored books on the uh, Freddy versus Jason on uh, the Halloween franchise, Taking Shape and Taking Shape 2. Mm -hmm. um, he has a book called Phantasm Exhumed, The Unauthorized Companion. It is a tremendous read, and I think there's a follow-up with more information on Ravenger that I'm going to have to pick up. So I would say anytime we're doing one of the big franchises, I immediately look to see if Dustin McNeil has a book about them out. Cause like he gets everybody involved. It's exhaustively researched and it. They're also really fun reads. So I found a quote here from his book and Rachel, would you mind reading from the notes, the, uh, what it was like for and why Baldwin was recast? Sure. Yeah. So it says, the move to recast was not some malicious directive handed down by a domineering studio executive, but rather a request, one of only two made by Universal, according to Don Coscarelli. Per the director's appeal, the studio agreed to let Baldwin and Bannister audition for their namesake roles in a desperate scenario. <laughs> He's like, please just give them a chance. Mm -hmm. uh, following his first and last tryout for a Coscarelli film ever, Bannister won back the part of Reggie, beating out rival applicant Jeffrey Tambor. Dang. Wow. Uh, Baldwin Who was may have less committed fortunate. a little bit of light treason during the <laughs> Yeah. Baldwin was less fortunate, flying in from Colorado on Thursday, October 29th for a videotaped recording. He was ultimately rejected for the role of Mike. Wah, wah. Uh, the degree to which Coscarelli challenged the studio on this has been contested over the years unlike his candid and much publicized regret over the recasting debacle. Had he completely stonewalled on Baldwin's behalf, Phantasm 2 might never have been made. 
Also, I mean, it's a kid, and and this one he's older. So if I was Don, I'd be like, we can get away with recasting here with like Reggie. It would have been a lot more obvious and harder, I think. So much more difficult. Yeah, um, you could make Tambor look like him. Yeah, but his voice. It wouldn't have like, been as cool. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about a lot about Jeffrey Tambor's early works necessarily, mm-hmm. but I just have a feeling like, you know. His personality is always kind of there. <laughs> was, he, was he WKRP in Cincinnati? He was on one know. of those shows. I feel um, like he was on those. His like big breakthrough was that sitcom. Yeah. Around so I this, have... I think around this time he was on Max Hedron, or like okay. that would have been a year or so oh. later. Mm-hmm. Um, and he looks like Jeffrey Tambor, yeah. like as you. He just has a mustache. I think is the only difference. But like mm-hmm. I don't know. It's hard for me to imagine that Tambor as badass is him like, with the flame i can't picture yeah. that t- jeffrey tambor w- with a flamethrower in a simulated sex scene like that is yeah. <laughs> very very difficult to imagine yeah. it's yeah. fun to imagine it um mm-hmm. and now i'm having trouble moving on from that visual <laughs> um but i think in, in doing some further reading it was basically the studio wanting someone that looked like a like ma- traditional male romantic lead and yeah. Michael Baldwin just not being that person. Um, what are your initial, I know we'll talk more about it as we get into the movie, but just for the sake of not being the only person talking right now, what are your initial thoughts on this kind of uh, casting decision? Like, does it work? Does it, does it pull you out in any way? It doesn't pull me out. I think the time is like enough that it may, you know, I like that Reggie is, you know, still there. Mm -hmm. Like, I think he does a great job. So I agree with their, well, you know, I like that they're able to keep him. Mike, I, you know, sorry. It doesn't really bother me that much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I only notice it because Mike comes back. Yep. Is the thing. Like, that's why I think of it as the anti-Mike one, because it's, because Mike comes back in, in the rest of the series. Yeah. And if that wasn't the case, I probably wouldn't have noticed really yeah it's um, like child's play right isn't that like basically what happens too and like, part- alex vincent comes yeah. back <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. yeah alex vincent is gone in part three mm-hmm. and then he's out of the series for a few, couple decades and then he comes back for like at the end of i want to say curse of chucky is the first time we see him again yeah that's you right. know now he's back for the show. i haven't seen chucky season two yet but i have to imagine He's a pretty big part of it. So Brad Pitt also auditions for the role of Mike here. Which is this him. true? I mean, I saw it on IMDb, but is this like yeah. one of those like random IMDb they trivia things? They talked that about it on the making of too. Oh, they so, did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. And it would have been around the time like he did like a starring spot in Freddy's Nightmares. Like he's in one of the... Uh, that really terrible spinoff of A Nightmare in Elm Street, which was, yeah. I tried to go back and rewatch a bunch of those when they were and I'm like, oh dear. Like, I remember <laughs> that was one where I loved that show as a kid. Like, I watched that in the Friday the 13th show every week on Friday nights when they would come on. And Freddy's Nightmares, like, it does not hold up. It's sad to say, <laughs> but it was bad. Yeah. Um, Year so before film on Louise, I think. So he wasn't mm-hmm. anywhere near being Brad Pitt yet. So yeah. I know, but still, like even in his early stuff, it's like he does have like a charisma to him. I'm surprised mm-hmm. he didn't. I mean, I'm just you know comparing him to Mr. Legros or however you say his name. I just well, I'm not Legros sure. is a very indie kind of guy, and I, I think that might be like Coscarelli probably saw something in him because the best stuff that the grow is in is like living in oblivion and like mm-hmm. safe and like mm-hmm. movies where he's like the independent movie actor guy. Yeah. So I get the feeling Don probably saw that in him mm-hmm. and felt camaraderie. Maybe yeah. I don't know. It's like pit's too it's like pretty. It's like, no. Pitt's too pretty. Yeah. 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 He might overshadow Reggie Bannister a bit too much. <laughs> totally. In this. Yeah. hundred um, percent. It is, or you might not be able to tell them apart. I mean, who knows? Um, you, that was a low blow in mean, and I apologize. Um, 
So yeah, the grow is like the definition of a working actor. Like I don't know a lot about him, but like looking up, he has like 130 credits. He's still working. He's in pretty much everything. And he's just like, when you look at his credits, he's like sixth from the top. Like usually he's not mm-hmm. the person who's going to like very often lead a movie, but he's in so many different things, just taking these roles. So good for him. Um, Scrim comes back to play the tall man. Cost Crowley's like, you got to lose your some weight, you know, cause the, uh, because he was like about 20 30 pounds over like the tall oh. man not that he was like a big man but just like the tall man such an angular kind of looking he had to kind of you can't have the punch you know what i mean it's like you can't have so funny you know and you oh that would have been a different movie um and he had to grow his hair back out as well for the role um i found this interesting like this movie was like shredded in secrecy uh, they were giving out scripts with titles like American Gothic, P2, Morningside, Threadbare, like doing anything they could except telling the people working on it. Yes, it's a phantasm movie. I remember like Mark Showstrom when he gets hired, he says like, oh, American Gothic, it's a phantasm sequel. Like he read like three pages of the script. He's like, we're making phantasm too. Um, I have a quote here from i think it's steve patino who is one of the uh special effects artists who's pretty bitter about his experience like Hmm. in being left behind after this out is out but uh like andy andrew do you mind reading this quote underneath where he talks about the secrecy on the set yeah secrecy on a film is fine especially where the where the plot is concerned but phantasm 2 took it too far Um, he told this to fear magazine shortly after the film's release There was a lot of power play on that film. At first, the production got a lot of people enthusiastic, but during the eight months of production, people started to hate one another. Yeah. And Hmm. it's interesting he says that, because when you read a lot of the recollections of making Phantasm 2, almost everybody has a universally positive experience making it. Even with, like, Legro replacing their friend Michael Baldwin, the cast and crew didn't seem to like take that out on the grow. They kind of like, Hey, you know, the studio said that he has to, they, we have to do it. So it's not his fault. If it's going to be anyone, it might as well be this guy. And like the effects team, the editors, like everybody working on the movie seems to like have a really positive experience, except for Patino, um, who, would go on and like really badmouth the film after it came out. And he had a, a justified gripe. Uh, his effects work went uncredited. Mm-hmm. Um, and he kind of made it clear that like he wanted the rights to the series after Phantasm 2 doesn't light up the box office. And he wanted to be at least be back for Phantasm 3. But I think he had burned a lot of bridges by that point. Somebody's just bitter. <laughs> Someone is just angry. Yeah, which you know, you have a bad experience yeah. in a movie, and you kind of want to let it be known. I think he yeah. was one of the few. Reading back, like some of the, the anecdotes years later, like most people do talk pretty positively about him, and they do kind of regret him not getting some of the credit that mm-hmm. he was due. They talk about him being the really strong force behind the scenes, making sure that the fx are up to snuff here and it's hard not to be like when you look at the um look at the talent brought in like mark showstrom coming off of working on evil dead 2 and uh, a nightmare in elm street part 2 is doing a lot of the work on this movie like he i kind of find he's like one of the underrated 80s fx artists like he works on so many things and yet i don't think we speak about him as much as we do with tom savini or the folks at K&B mm-hmm. who also work on this movie. Like K&B mm-hmm. is brought on at Shilstrom's request uh, to work on the effects and creature designs. Um, and you see that here. You definitely see what, because Phantasm's not a huge special effects movie. It's very much like tone and atmosphere. And then the effects are used pretty judiciously here. Mm-hmm. It's like a much more of a spectacle movie. Mm-hmm. Um Patino was brought on to do the optical effects required of the sphere after the passing of Willard Green. Um, and I would say like the ball effects, like they work, like mm-hmm. it looks awesome here. So yeah. he, his work is pretty great. 
Um, I found this really interesting. Phantasm fans are brought on as crew and supporting cast. Like folks that had really talked up the movie, Hos- Coscarelli hires him. So he hires like Guy Alford uh, as a production assistant. And he's like with the body being ex- uh, ex- embalmed during the um, during that scene. He has uh, Tony Froman at craft service and also one of the extras. And then uh, Kristen Deem had befriended uh, Coscarelli and Angus Scrim and Reggie Bannister after the first movie. Uh, she's um, one of the folks that helps out with casting. She does all the hearse wrangling, like she gets all the hearses. <laughs> and she's also credited as like a, a unit director and a storyboard artist for this movie huh. as well. And she talks in, uh, she talks about her experience and like sitting at the dinner table, like over at Anchor Scrim's house and like designing the storyboards and going over them. And it's like, again, it seemed like a really positive experience for most people. So um fred miro comes back for the score and rachel i'm going to turn to you what do we feel about the score this time around (laughs) i'm also curious i mean it it feels of its time Mm -hmm. you know i mean what if i think he hopped on the you know the synth train maybe a little too much and i don't think it's his fault that some of the instrument shape instrumentation choices i mean especially now sound like really dated mm-hmm. it, to me it sounds very much like you know the 80s early 90s made for tv movie kind of stuff but mm-hmm. i do love that they continue to use the familiar theme and evolving that theme um for like there's like a love theme that we hear uh, so it's a little cheesy, but I, I don't blame him for that. I think it's just the time period and that per- mm-hmm. those particular sounds haven't necessarily aged very well and they yeah. got overused a lot, especially um, as made for TV movies started getting really prolific. To me, it like it reminded me of like Pet Cemetery 2 in some ways, like that vibe where it's like mm-hmm. it was a real big movie, but also kind of felt like a TV movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I love Pet Cemetery 2. So, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But fun fact, I like it more than the original Pet Cemetery as a movie. <laughs> I mean, Clancy Brown is hard <laughs> to beat there. <laughs> But yeah, it, it's nice that he brought him back, though, for sure. And I mean, yeah, those those themes are iconic. So it, w- yeah. it was nice to hear them again. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Coscarelli is very much like Sam Raimi in that they have a troupe they work with. They have mm-hmm. he has like Fred Myro and Reggie Bannister and in the future, Michael Baldwin will return. And a lot of the folks behind the scenes on Phantasm 2 also worked on the first movie and it very much carries over from production to production just like sam raimi you know works with like rob tappert and he works with bruce campbell and he works with his brother you know ted and ivan over and over again and there's a certain comfort that comes with that and i think that's why i don't want to say these movies sound relax or feel relaxed but it feels like you're getting like a a well-oiled machine that yeah. is coming I, out of these movies. I will say too that this time he had uh, Christopher Stone helping him, who mm-hmm. it looks like oh. goes on to do the rest of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so going, so that's you know kind of cool. Yep. <laughs> and then also I noticed um, Alan Howarth helped with the hey. sound on this mm. movie, and Alan Howarth obviously best big big partner of John Carpenter, mm. and is a total gearhead himself. And I think. John Carpenter owes him for a lot, but I'm mean, really, just... yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. They were friends, and I think Alan has, you know, just a more more knowledge of gear, and it mm-hmm. helps Carpenter a lot, probably like with that. Um, anyways, so I'm just curious. I don't know a lot about like the making of this because mm-hmm. I don't think the score has been released ever. So it's not there's not necessarily a lot out there, which is kind mm. of interesting. But uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they were all kind of you know chipping in their thoughts and things because yeah. alan howarth is great so it's cool to see him on this too yeah i definitely agree that it's not as memorable as like the really stripped down bare bones like first score like those that 
score is so iconic in Phantasm, and I think it really contributes to the overall like tone and feel of that movie. What I the one thing I liked is when they have a more orchestral use of the original score that comes mm-hmm. in a couple times. Like everything does feel just much bigger in this movie, and like you said, it's much more of its time. Like it definitely belies like the more action oriented nature of this movie than it does being like a horror adventure. Yeah. Well, you can just feel the influence of Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday. Like by this point, like all of these films are, you know, just juggernauts. And so mm-hmm. I think you just, we can talk about that more later, but you feel that influence in the yeah. music along with every single other aspect of this movie. Yeah. So. Excellent. so the movie gets put in front of the ratings board and on May 31st, 1988, they come back with an X rating, basically less than two months from the premiere, like about five or six weeks from the premiere of this movie, it gets an X and it specifically for a couple of reasons. Number one, the ball burrowing itself into the acolytes body, like going through its back and out through the mouth. And Tom Pollock, who was the head of universal studios goes to Coscarelli. Like he hadn't seen the movie to this point. He then views like why it's getting this rating. He's like, I can't fight for this movie to get an R rating <laughs> the way it is. Like, there's nothing I can do. Um, they also, the ratings board objected to the priest drilling as well. And Coscarelli made it a point to say, like, look, we timed it so that the drilling is exactly as long as it was in the first movie. Like, it's the same mm. length. We're not doing anything different. And the ratings board replied with basically, uh, we're a lot more stringent now. I mean, basically, you hear this a lot. Like, it happened with the Friday the 13th movies in particular. Yeah. Like, once that first movie kind of, like, snuck by the ratings board with, like, nobody expecting it to be a hit, so a lot of things slid, they made it a point to basically do a hatchet job on every single movie after the fact. And I think that's mm. part of what happens here. So there are like, you can find like extended scenes of phantasm too, where it is a lot bloody and it's it, a lot gets through in this movie. But I think like the priest death in particular is a lot gorier um, in the extended version of it. So they do bring it back. Cause they're not going to release it with an X rating. Like universal is just not going to do that. Um, it gets an R after some cuts, it opens wide on July 8th, 1988, and it really fizzles at the box office. Mm. Uh, it opens behind sequels to Short Circuit, Crocodile <laughs> Dundee, and Arthur. So mm. like, it's lower than Arthur 2. Um, it has a lower yeah. debut yeah. than Poltergeist 3, oh. which kind of killed that. So I, and again, and the reviews are also like really unkind. The reviews are like Variety calls it utterly unredeeming. Siskel and Ebert, like Siskel calls it one of the worst movies of all time. Not which true. it's not A, it's not, and it's kind of par for the course for Siskel with any movie with gore in it. I mean, he was notoriously hard on movies. Both of them were notoriously hard on movies with a lot of gore. Uh, Ebert said Coscarelli was too lazy to write characters or plot. And the San Francisco Chronicle called it brainless. So <laughs> I think this might be a case of a movie finding its legs on home video. Oh, totally. Um, you know, and I think like a lot of movies like Halloween four um, does like $18 million and that's considered a huge success. But I think it's considered a huge success because like everybody rushed out and got it on VHS a year later, you know, and that added to, you know, that added to the box office at that point. Like, so I think that might be the case here. I think this movie, and we'll talk about its legacy at the end of the show, like it enjoys like, I think a pretty solid reputation at this point. I was just gonna say, it's probably like, I feel like too much time probably passed too. Yeah. And like, and just like Phantasm itself. Like I know it was successful, but you know, not on Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street levels. So it's kind of, I don't know. I just wonder what they were expecting. I guess yeah. it's yeah. It's it's kind of hard. I, you got to imagine a lot of people are maybe hearing about Phantasm for the first time. Yeah, and yeah. 
I don't know if they were even able to get the first movie on VHS at that point so they could catch up. So it's kind of hard to jump into a sequel, especially Mm -hmm. as we'll talk about here. There's a pretty dense mythology. Like it's kind of hard to just jump into this movie and without having seen the first one. It's definitely like I saw a nightmare on Elm street two first and you could jump into that movie and, and, not have seen the first one and get a pretty good idea. It works as a standalone movie. It's really hard to do that with this movie. Mm-hmm. It's good, like Halloween too, which I, mm-hmm. you know we're gonna just like how it starts. <laughs> yep. This one right. is nine years or eight years since seventy nine. Uh, so nine years since yeah, nine the years, first so almost a decade after. Does that make it a legacy sequel by today's standards? Um, Maybe. Who knows? Like, I don't really know where the cutoff is. I feel like ten years would be the cutoff, but. Like, I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah. Not sure. I'm not sure that was a thing. That thought it, it was not a thing it. then, but I mean, that's what <laughs> right. it is now. But and you could even get into his phantasm elevated horror based on the themes. And, mm-hmm. You know, we won't <laughs> do that here. Um, let's talk about this movie a bit now. Let's talk about what do we think of like Phantasm 2 picking up right where the first one left off, like diving right into the end. I love the previously ons on any of these things. Um, Mm -hmm. I I do wonder if that's actually part of the whole, it's difficult to watch the first one. So we're just going to kind of pretend that it didn't really happen in a certain way. And so, cause that's all of this happened in Mike's mind. It isn't what really happened. Reggie is just like, although Reggie seems to deny that he fought off the Jawa at one point in this movie too, which I don't understand why he would do that, but there's, and I wonder if that's that's some of that coming in. It's like, eh, no one's remembering the last movie, so we can kind of like do our own thing. But the fact that they pick up right where it leaves off with a very obvious not Mike, like from behind, that it's I don't know it. I don't. It's a. I think it's actually it makes sense on how to get the story going. But, like, and especially if I think about it, like, as Coscarelli in the making of said, like, once he got to that, once he made that decision, it was easier to write the rest of the movie. Mm -hmm. And I can see that, and I understand that, but I can't help but wonder if we didn't do that, (laughs) if we just, like, jumped straight to Mike at the the hospital, like, would that have been a bad thing? But It might be more accessible. Yeah. It might be, I. But I think they do the same thing in three and four, where they pick up right where the last one. They do the, mm-hmm. they do the Rocky thing, where it's always the last five minutes of the previous yep. movie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like it in movies, I, the Rocky, you know, and mm-hmm. Creed, and Halloween two, and like I like that when I'm watching them. Mm-hmm. At the time, though, thinking what we were just talking about, the nine years in between the scarcity of the original film like it does feel like a weird choice if you're trying to like reintroduce this franchise to a lot of people on a much larger scale who probably haven't seen the first one especially when you don't have to like I do think that there was a way that this could have been written and you could still achieve all of those goals without necessarily having it pick up right there at the tail end of a movie that a lot of people probably didn't see Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's an odd choice when I think about it that way and probably a choice I would have done differently, but, you know, sitting here in 2022, watching them back to back is a lot of fun and I enjoy it, but yeah. I don't know. It's watching odd... Reggie age instantly. <laughs> yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. He aged better than a lot of people did. Like I'm not, it's just noticeable. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. 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 It's an, well, he looked probably the age he is here he looks that age in the original phantasm like he does not yeah. look like a and he is like a early 20s guy in that movie which you know uh, I don't, I don't, the, the ponytail <laughs> yeah um it's, 70s. It's, it's fascinating to me because like when you do the recaps and like say Rocky or Friday the 13th. Those are like really straight forward movies. Like, okay, you watch the end of Rocky, you, or the, you watch the beginning of Rocky too. You kind of know like, okay, I get Rocky in a nutshell. You watch like Friday the 13th part two and you get the recap and you, you know what's going on. It, you can pick it up pretty easily. Phantasm is such a dense movie 
terms of plot, in terms of themes, in terms of character development, in terms of just the overall feel. It's such a non-linear narrative that what you get here doesn't quite give you enough to like i mean we we watched the movie right before this so we're able to kind of like oh yeah this is what happened i wonder like if audiences in 1988 like walked up being like i have no idea what the first few minutes of that movie were and the rest of you can kind of go along for the ride guarantee Um, guarantee there's no way you could and i think you know you you even if you're looking at you know the friday the 13th or the later halloweens it's the people, well, maybe Halloween's not the best example, but the people are usually different. In, the killer, you know, the villain is the same, but the storyline is different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like it doesn't matter who the people are. You just like, oh, okay, yeah. that's the bad guy and this is what he yeah. does. All right, moving on. But like Phantasm, mm-hmm. it's so all over the place and it's very ambiguous, like we talked about in the last one. Is it a dream? Is it real? And so mm-hmm. all of that, walking right into that, not knowing that, yeah, I would have no idea what's going on. Yeah. I do think it does a good job, though, of establishing right away that this is going to be a much bigger movie and it's going to have a much different tone than the original Phantasm. Like you are like right away, the effects work of like Showstrom and uh, Kurtzman and Nicotero, all of that is right on full display when you see the not Jawas for the first time. Like yeah. instead of just being these robed figures, you get like a lot more hideous detail. And there's also a lot more of them on screen. So mm-hmm. you have like that going for it right away. And you know already this is going to be a lot more action oriented movie. Cause you get, you know, the the fight scenes and then the giant explosion with, you know, <laughs> anger scrim like <laughs> coolly calmly walking back you know to the thing with the flames going behind him it's pretty awesome there are two houses that explode Mm -hmm. within 15 minutes of this movie yes it's awesome it it actually is pretty awesome also liz like you get we get liz right Mm -hmm. away and like that odd connection is made with the the hearts and oh my i know mike mike with the heart mike and the hearts like I, I stopped it to like read what she was writing some and it was yeah it was uh, yeah but like that whole, that um, whole like monologue that she goes on um yeah immediately sets the tone like oh, okay this has got to have some of those elements all right yes, let's, this let's is do gonna this be, <laughs> and it's a very much like feels like my first crush type of movie which i guess makes sense given that you know, Mike is probably at a little bit of a rest of development, having been in an institution from the age of 12 or 13 guess, to age yeah. 20. You know, he probably doesn't have a lot of experience with young women. The ladies. So, the ladies, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe he does. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe the asylum is in is like a one-way ticket to Pound Town, and who knows? You know, I mean, I don't know who's to, who's to say. Who's to say? <laughs> so, um. So we get the reintroduction of Reggie Bannister here. Um, what do we think of this movie's, like, I think what it does is it expands the scope of the first movie and kind of sets the template because I don't haven't seen the remaining three movies, but from what I know about them, this feels like one very long story. Like it's the, you kind of like can't skip around in this series. Like it is very much telling the story of, Michael and Reg and Reggie and Jody and their battles with the tall man. And I think this is maybe the one that sets that in place mm-hmm. in that you kind of, what do you feel like the tall man's agenda is and does it work? Uh, Reggie question. becomes like the heart <laughs> of the series here. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, that'll be true for like the rest of the movies. It also, the, that road, that traveling around aspect is going to keep happening in the other movies. Um, but for the life of me, and I've seen all five of these movies, his motive is not something I can a hundred percent explain for the tall man mm-hmm. and that, and it could be, I'm remembering poorly. Um, so I'll, I'll say that, but I also don't know if I care that much. He's just mm-hmm. being evil and doing something weird, something profoundly weird. <laughs> and that's like enough for me. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, I like how it expands it you know well i don't know i have mixed feelings about there's something like 
kind of unnerving about him just like parking it in like one place and just kind of slowly doing this kind of you know shady behavior at this cemetery apparently yeah and but like that one you know he wasn't really murdering the town he was just kind of stealing away their dead right Mm -hmm. which is really evil but in a really sly way and i think that that's really interesting whereas here he's still robbing the graves but it's just out in the open you've got all these empty graves then you've got all these towns that are just like uh completely decimated which you know being the uh, the Stephen King fan I am I can't help but think like oh so all right if Coscarelli was reading a bunch of Dune before he's clearly gotten into Stephen King and we've got some elements of you know Salem's Lot and needful things here that, these towns fingernail <laughs> thing that, yep the fingernail yeah. thing you know yeah. it's classic King right there <laughs> Randall yeah. Colburn would you know say some words about that but I it's so it's it's interesting that it's on this big of a scale and so out in the open um i i understand why they did that it makes him more threatening and you know these are the folks who are going to stop him and the st- it raises the stakes but at the same time it makes it a little bit less believable and also i'm still confused about why <laughs> yeah yeah he needs those not jawas he you know there's only so many in these small towns, right? Yeah, it just like it's like it raises more questions almost and doesn't mm-hmm. really it doesn't really expand the mythos. It just expands the scale and the scope yeah. of what he's doing, but it doesn't actually enrich it in any way. Okay. If that makes sense. In my I, opinion. No, I don't I, hate it. It's I agree. Just... <laughs> Yeah, I do like some of the visual flair that you get from it. I think there is yes. something to be said about like the sight of all of these graves that have been unearthed and you just see these empty cemeteries. Like there's something really disturbing about that because mm-hmm. like you said, Rachel, he's not even trying to hide in plain sight. Like he doesn't care at this point. Like he's like, no one can stop me anyway, so I can just do what I want. And then one of the towns they drive through when you see how desolate it looks, um, how much ruin that he's wrought. Like there's something like very cool about that. And I do see, we mentioned this when we talked about the first movie, how this movie or how Phantasm in particular, it's going to go on to influence other media like Supernatural comes Mm -hmm. to mind. I can't help but watch this movie and where the series will go and think of that television show where it's like two brothers Mm -hmm. and they're, driving around trying to fight evil uh in a muscle car no less oh yeah i love the road trip part of this also does Mm -hmm. that did that town you know now that barbarian is out it looked a lot like the town where like the house is in barbarian (laughs) isn't that just detroit Uh, no shade to detroit i mean but i'm just like isn't it just detroit in barbarian yeah Um. i think that is just parts of detroit right now okay well it looks like that i guess (laughs) oh this movie predicted Michigan's future. Um, mm-hmm. This is much more of an action movie than a horror movie. Too. Totally. I don't find this movie particularly scary. No. Um, <laughs> but it is like you get a huge focus on the weapons. Like you get the mm-hmm. quadruple barrel shotgun, mm-hmm. the blowtorch. Loved epic, it. Epic chainsaw battle. Um, With the weirdest like penis measure moment ever mm-hmm. um, in a in a film <laughs> and it's funny like it, it is funny yeah you know like reggie's face when he like fires up the chainsaw and he's all excited only to see one that would put the blade in leatherface to shame mm-hmm. like it's something like hysterical about kind of like seeing that there's a lot of like and reggie seems to get over the demise of his family pretty quickly like that yeah, yeah. Yeah, I totally forgot he had a family. So uh, did he. So. Yeah, that's yeah, so not wrong for me to do that. Apparently. <laughs> what do we think of the shift to like a more action oriented movie? I mean, I like. I think it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, I'm not super into action movies, but I I think because of just the sheer weirdness of this, like it makes me like it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I and it makes sense. Like. Mm-hmm. Just like the last film, I can see 
you know, the influences. And I'm sure, you know, Universal in the meeting was like, all right, Don, listen, we got to like, you know, Friday the 13th, Evil Dead. Like, we really want to turn this into one of those films. Don, you got to do it. And so I like I of course, like, you know, they wanted to cash in on those sort of things. And so he had to put some of those those more humorous elements and bombastic elements into this because nobody is going to go at this time and see a horror movie and sit there for the weird psychological dreamy sci-fi fantasy nonsense that the first one was and i say nonsense lovingly like Mm -hmm. but they just he couldn't he couldn't do that like this was not the time and the place universal was not the studio um and so that's that's what he delivered and it's so ridiculous and even if the story doesn't make sense i appreciate it because along with those big action things we get some incredible giant uh like the special effects like you were talking about we get these wild scenes that would not fit in the other phantasm Mm -hmm. it would feel Mm -hmm. it would it wouldn't line up right but here it makes sense Mm -hmm. and they just continue to kind of feed each other (laughs) until Mm -hmm. things just get bigger and bigger and more explosive Mm -hmm. and wilder and so i i appreciate that it wasn't just the action that they also ratcheted up the gore and oh the car is even bigger although i looked into it because i wasn't sure and apparently because in this one it's a hemi cuda which is bigger than the last one and uh but apparently it's not a real cuda it's not a real hemi cuda because those are very rare and i was like Mm. how did they get one of those and it was a it was a fake replica that they basically just put the the hemi cuda on but you know that's like it feels like don like don would know that you know so Mm -hmm. like it's like oh he did have his hands all over this movie still it Mm -hmm. didn't it didn't get so big that it didn't feel like him, which I appreciated. Like, yeah. I still feel like, yeah, this is very much a, you know, a Don Coscarelli film. So it doesn't feel like it's impersonating a phantasm right. film. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel like just studio notes all over it and all mm-hmm. the all the charm and all the like kind of directorial imprint has been taken away from Coscarelli it still feels very much even though it feels very much in line with with the first movie even though the tone is different and some of his other work like John Dies at the End and Bubble mm-hmm. Hotemp like you can kind of tell a Don Coscarelli movie and I think like mm-hmm. it has that personal stamp on it the only thing that strikes me is kind of of not exactly Coscarelli but more of its time thing is when they they go to they go to one of the murdered towns and they find fake Liz, mm-hmm. like hunchback oh. Liz, who has like <laughs> a like Freddy Krueger esque tall man growing out of her. That's the only thing that seems It's amazing. It no, it's really cool. It's a really good effect, but that's the only thing that seems I'm, I'm not gonna say out of place because it still kind of mm-hmm. fits the logic, but that's the thing that looks like it was taken out of an Elm Street movie mm-hmm. and put yeah. into a phantasm. Yeah. That's the only it's... thing that I'm like, okay. I'm trying to think. So part three of A Nightmare on Elm Street would have been 86 or 87. 87. Mm-hmm. I looked it up because I was okay. curious because right. this definitely because, had some Dream Warrior vibes. Yeah. yeah. It has the Freddy Worm. And like the Liz worm, yeah. even looks a little bit like Patricia Arquette, like the um, Paula Irvine who plays Liz, like even resembles Patricia Arquette a little bit. Um mm-hmm. And it has that Freddy Worm, but also like the higher pitched Angus Scrim voice too. Mm-hmm. It's kind of adorable. Like, oh, mm-hmm. baby Angus, <laughs> Angus Scrim, who's a worm baby. But it's, it is like a really cool effect. But you're right. It kind of like tonally jumps out as like different from the rest of the movie. But I think kind of fits that overall. Like we have an action horror vibe going to it. Like you could cut that scene and probably not lose anything. But, mm-hmm. oh, man, I'm really glad, I'm glad it's, it's there. there. Also, the um, romance. Like, I don't think that – I I don't know Don Coscarelli personally. So – and I haven't read this book. But I do feel like maybe if he had his way, it would have just been Reggie and Mike hunting the tall man. Mm-hmm. Like, a little bit more classic and, like, simple there. And so – but then again, the studio people were like, oh, these films got final mm-hmm. girls. We got a girl. We got to have a girl. You got to have a girl in there, Don. And so he put it in there. But just that whole romance and the way that these women are written is just 
absurd. It's, it's uh, yeah, he does shy away from that in the later movies. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you that. I won't go mm. too deep into it, but yeah, he does yeah. realize his strengths mm-hmm. yeah. down the line. So uh, it's like yeah. they're there, but it's it's very funny how yeah. they're there. <laughs> Samantha yes, yes. Phillips, who plays Alchemy, looks like she's having the time of her life in yeah. this role. Her Number name's one, Alchemy. Role, Alchemy. Yeah. Alchemy, yeah. Which is you can call that, me Kemi. <laughs> right. Which is a choice. Um which is definitely a choice. She we... looks like she's having the time of her life in this. The little that she's given to do is pretty great. Yeah. I do, however, kind of feel like that her on the slab scene, mm-hmm. if that was excised, mm. would have been a little bit better. Um, that, and I understand why it's there. It's the 80s. You got to get teenage boys mm. in, the, in the theater. Um, but like, I don't trust her when she shows up because You've she's the dead girl. Dead. Yeah. And so yeah. when she's like evil at the end, I'm like, well, yeah, of course she was evil at the end. Yeah. Like, you know, it was like, she's the the lady in lavender for, yep. this, for this movie. Yeah. And like that, that kind of bothers me. Um, mm-hmm. But as a character, she's, you're right, she's having a fun time. Yeah. And we have that showgirls-esque sex scene that mm-hmm. I, <laughs> so, is so weird. She, um, she talked about that, and she talks about, like, she, when she was, like, getting into the character, she went to Coscarelli, and she's like, well, look at, you know, Reggie Bannister, and look at, like, Jamie LeGraw. And she's like, tell me why, like, Alchemy is into Reggie and not Michael. Come on. And Coscarelli, his response is, I don't know. I think you have a fetish for bald guys. <laughs> so, like, that's literally the answer that he gave her. So she really went with it. And so she's like, mm-hmm. all right, if I have a fetish for bald guys, I am going to go so over the top. And that's why in that scene, like, she's rubbing his, like, you know, his his dome. She's kissing it. It's like, she's, like, getting off on it. And she's really having a blast doing it. She's like, well... If I'm going to have a fetish for bald guys, then I'm really going to go for this. And I, I there's a lot more to her. The little screen time she has, there is a lot more there to enjoy with her than there is with Liz, who I think is just kind of like she comes off as way younger. I, she mm-hmm. comes off almost like childlike. Um, yeah. Then and I just think that's not a performance issue. I just think that's the role as it's written is kind of like there's not a lot there. I, I also do appreciate that. I mean, because Reggie's clearly a little older and he just like picks this girl up off the side of the road. Like what I liked about Reggie in the first one is that he wasn't creepy, mm-hmm. right? Like he had this ice cream truck and this disgusting ponytail, and but like he was never creepy. But I'm glad that they had her or you know whether it was her choice or theirs but like to be that kind of over the top with it it actually like didn't make it creepy whereas if she was playing it kind of more serious or a little bit more like liz or like a little more Mm -hmm. typical of a lot of those kind of characters in the 80s it would have been kind of gross and creepy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas here it's come it comes off you know, like it's, you know, a, a nod and a wink and tongue in cheek. And it's kind of mm-hmm. like, okay, like this is funny. Like it doesn't yeah. take away from Reggie's character, right. which I think could have if she was presented a little bit differently. Right. Mm-hmm. And if she's like a minion of the tall man at this time, like that also could explain some of the behaviors as well. Yeah. Just like he, she's, she's supposed to be the inside. Yes. Role, if you will. So yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not that that happens per se, but um, like, it could be. I don't know. It's, yeah. 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 And I just kind of like how Coscarelli is throwing his friend Reggie a bone. Like, okay, <laughs> you are going to be the romantic action hero leading man <laughs> in a way that you... All right. You know, which is like probably the least likely person you would ever... Like, you look at Bruce Campbell and you think like, yeah, this makes sense. Like, Ash makes sense as like your... Mm-hmm kind of bumbling but heroic action star romantic lead because bruce campbell is like a very handsome man Mm -hmm. and reggie bannister is like just you know he's a dude he's a dude dude yeah 100 percent. but my god you get the turn from reg and this is like after this movie bannister goes on to make a lot of similar like he has a career trajectory now like Mm -hmm. this movie is why he's able like 
10, 20, 30 years later to appear in so many like B horror movies as a recognizable kind of beloved character actor at this point. And I would say it's all due to that boogie down hat. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Yep. Let's talk about a little bit about Reggie and Mike and the characters before we wrap up here. Do mm. we like this transformation of Reggie from like sidekick to, you know, an action star that's doing somersaults over people's head and then wielding a chainsaw? What do we think? Yes. Love it. Yes. No notes. No, <laughs> no, Several notes, notes but done. I still okay. like it. <laughs> I, I just, he's able to balance that, that kind of lovable dorky comedy mm-hmm. and action. And it's not, the action's not so demanding where maybe his, you know, physical prowess would, come into question a little Mm -hmm. bit like the the action is innocent enough where it's still believable like nothing he's doing is you know schwarzenegger-esque like he's not leaping across buildings and doing just absolute insanity kind of things that were common in action movies here um and so so it makes sense even like like the car wreck it's like, you know, that that car chase where they, they flip the car even. Like, it's a big stunt, but also it's not, like, so unbelievable that these right. characters would accidentally do something like that. So mm-hmm. I, I appreciate that Reggie, what is required of him is still, seems feasible. <laughs> grounded, yeah, it's more grounded. <laughs> yeah. Well, I kind of feel like, <clears throat> sorry, I feel like Coscarelli kind of realizes that Reggie becomes our audience conduit like our our surrogate for this after because mike has like psychic stuff going on he's not Mm -hmm. a kid anymore (laughs) he's like he's harder to understand from an audience perspective like in in so much and so like having regular guy reggie the ice cream man um like become that audience surrogate and this kind of continues to the rest of the series like really makes a lot of sense and yeah, so I think it's actually a very important decision to make mm-hmm. Reggie more fleshed out and more awesome dude Reggie. So it works. It works. Yeah, yeah. It works. I just love, like, when he, at one point, after he picks up Kemi, he just looks at Mike, he's like, well, the road gets lonely, man. Like, a lot of miles <laughs> on the road. Just like, <laughs> what a dude thing to say. Like, it doesn't yeah. get better than that. He's not wrong, you know? I mean, he's definitely... You know, Reggie has needs. Um, and we don't know well, how long it's been since <laughs> since his family died at that point. It's uh, it's at least, it's probably a few months at least. Probably. Um, probably not that that's not still weird, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll briefly talk about Mike. I don't think like James or Girl is bad as Michael. No, no. I did find it a bit distracting only because I had just watched Phantasm like a week before mm. this. Um, so that and then watching the trailer immediately for part three immediately after this Mm -hmm. one and seeing michael baldwin back being like oh that is a bit that is a bit jarring not that the performance is bad and the other thing that maybe pulled me out a little bit i thought the grow in this looks a lot like john shepherd who Mm -hmm. replaces Corey feldman in friday the 13th part five as tommy jarvis so i kept being like seeing the grow and thinking like that's tommy jarvis as well mm-hmm. which is and it is interesting it's a time when like you're shifting a little bit away from the final girl and you have like tommy jarvis in the friday the 13th movies and ash williams and evil dead 2 and now you have like with michael and reggie like the final guys like a little bit of that shift away from fi- final girls is like slashers i guess like what would you call this movie it's not a slasher it's not as sci-fi as the first movie. Like, I don't know. Aside from like action horror, I don't know what genre to maybe kind of like put this in. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's like that's why it's that that horror science fiction fantasy thing like yeah. fits, but now you just tack action on earlier in there. Yeah, like you know, horror, action, science fiction, fantasy. <laughs> I, and I do think at the time, you know, it would have no problem like, oh, yeah, this is a horror movie. I mm-hmm. think, oh, totally. of course, we've become a little bit jaded and cynical and the effects have aged and all these things have aged a little. So it's a little bit harder to look at this and be like, oh, yeah, this is a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it is. But mm-hmm. yeah, I don't 
the I action mean, war, I guess. People get you know, spheres that drill into their heads and all up in their bodies. I mean, oh, like, yeah. Also, yeah. those spheres are amazing. They're really not cool only do one. we get one, we get three, mm-hmm. and they are brutal. And these ball scenes are just incredible. I mean, of of course, the effects, but also I just like like the extended ball mythos and mm-hmm. like how they're different. Totally. Yeah. And I so I loved how that expanded. Also, how one of them was a key, though. That yeah. was a little like, I, OK, I don't know about that, but so, so I appreciate sorry. the effort. <laughs> Well, and like Michael guessing that like, well, as long as it has like flesh embedded in it, we'll be fine. Like, that's a pretty big risk to take there, my man. That Turned is, I right. don't know. Yeah. He is right. But like, I don't know if I would take that risk. Um, yeah, the ball work is incredible here. Um, <laughs> Some great ball work. Just really excellent ball work. <laughs> oh, we'll leave that one in. We'll leave yeah. that one in. Um <laughs> The ball's back, baby. And he's brought. I don't know why they didn't add. And he's, he's brought, brought friends. his friends. He's brought his little buddies. Um, he brought his two friends. Okay, I'm done. Yeah. Oh boy, but like I think they realize, like, okay, what do people remember about the first movie? They remember mm-hmm. the tall man, and they remember like the ball. So that gets a lot more. Like you don't get a lot of Angus Scrim. Like I'm kind of surprised how little he is in when it comes to this movie but they make up for that on the other end you know one ball can shoot lasers and it obviously mm-hmm. has like like it's like it could just do whatever we need it to do like what are the ball's powers i don't know whatever the scene calls for at this moment we'll just give it those powers um but that moment when it goes through the uh minion like through the back and then like it's like kind of coming out through its mouth like amazing fucking amazing like, work there so great. Yeah. Incredible standing um, ovation. <laughs> and I'm I'm gonna support the key thing because it shows that the tall man learned from the previous film, right. whether or not it happened or not. Because his his tuning fork room, you could just go in there. There wasn't like <laughs> there wasn't like anything keeping you from going in there before. So he realized that he needs to like lock and key that stuff. He needs to have some sort of security. Yeah. <laughs> Why he decided to make the ball the key is another thing, but mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, it's um, nice to see a villain learn from his mistake. That's all I'm I saying. like how they were housed in like a little coffin. <laughs> yes, I know. It's, it's so house on haunted hill. Um, just like, <laughs> so Kurtzman, uh, who designed, who did the ear gag for the priest in this, um, uses that same effect a few years later when he on Reservoir Dogs as well. So mm. I'm like, that looks really familiar. And then I read that, I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense now. Like that is. The policeman getting his uh, the cop getting his ear cut off in Reservoir Dog. So the effects are amazing. Like cutting off your hand to run away from the ball, only to get bamboozled by it not too long after. Love it. Um, the the effects like from top to bottom in this movie are just like it's and it's funny because it's not one of those movies I think people talk about when they talk about like the better special effects movies of the eighties, but it is. Mm-hmm right up there with them even though this is more action there is one moment in this movie that i think stands out when it comes to like talking about maybe the existential dread of the first where when the tall man confronts the priest and he has that killer line like you think when you die you go to heaven you come to us like that's creepy Mm -hmm. especially because you see what it looks like when you go to them and that you're shrunken mm-hmm. down, you're made into a Jawa and then you're doing who knows what kind of work on some desolate planet. And again, we mentioned this with the first movie. Um, Stephen King had to be thinking of this movie when he wrote revival mm-hmm. because the end of that book and like what the afterlife looks like mm-hmm. feels like it is straight out of phantasm and that kind of enslavement. Um, I just that line, especially as someone who's a kind of a lapsed Catholic himself, it creeps me out so much. I thought of like, nope, there is no heaven. Like once you die, there is only slavery for all of eternity. Like that is, it's really, really gets me every time. There's yeah, a, uh... I, 
I wish they would have leaned it. into that just a little bit more because I think that would have made it all a little bit more interesting. Like, it's a great mm-hmm. line. Don't get me wrong. I wish it was just kind of maybe expanded on or I don't know. Like maybe there's more tall mans or mm-hmm. I don't I also haven't seen the rest. So put there's, you know, take there's, this there's all more to come. All, <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. There's there's right. more to come. Um, yeah. I, I you have to think that when he's doing part two and knowing that it's gonna be picked up by Universal, that he's probably thinking and I know the third one doesn't come out for another like seven years, but he's probably thinking a couple movies ahead. Like, mm-hmm. all right, we're going to be continuing this story and here's an outline of what's going to happen next time. So I think that line's not an accident. Um, again, Angus Scrim is the tall man, I think is like one of the most terrifying villains in horror. He doesn't need any makeup. He doesn't need a lot of, he has very few lines. Like I think if you add up all of his dialogue in the first four movies it's a little bit over eight minutes altogether Mm -hmm. all he needs is that look that Mm -hmm. baritone voice and a suit that's maybe one or two sizes too small because it just makes him look like he's bursting out of it and he is a terrifying figure in these movies i love it Mm -hmm. i i sometimes wonder like i doubt this but i can't help but think of like him being like a proto slender man but mm-hmm. I feel like the people that probably made that up on the internet didn't realize that phantasm movies exist. Mm-hmm. No shade to, you know, internet kids. But maybe, maybe not. But that's like that's a thing that I think You can shade of. them. It's fine. You yeah. can shade those, shade yeah. those motherfuckers. <laughs> Stupid generation Y. Yeah. Ugh. So, yeah, it's... that. That's... the And the it's so simple. Tall guy, well-dressed. That's it. That's all you need. Nope. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just like the guy in Home Alone, right? Like, that guy's terrifying. No, it's, totally the same. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same concept. You're totally right. Mm-hmm. I mean, the voice helps, too, but... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just the look, just the raised eyebrow, the glower that he's able to give. Like, I love it. I absolutely love. Um, all right, so let's wrap. Let's kind of, like, just finish up here. The if, if I think if there's an issue with this movie... It's that it kind of like, even though it's much different from the first one, at times it kind of calls back a little bit too much to Phantasm as well. You have the scenes that are pulled like directly from the movie and spliced into this. You have that whole introduction, which recaps the first movie. But then you have these callbacks, like at the funeral parlor, you have like the the uh, service is about to begin outside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Only there just to call back to the first movie. Um, but also like the ending of this movie is a, like a, a direct callback to the end of yeah. the first movie as mm-hmm. well. It's well, easy. Death <laughs> is like shot for shot almost. So yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah. it feels easy to me. Like it feels like an easy way out. Um, I I understand a lot of the others just you know because like we've been saying that the time and people maybe not familiar with it like i understand those but the ending i don't hate it Mm -hmm. but i it would have been cool to see something a little a little different (laughs) not exactly the same also just before we leave i'm sorry i have to liz whatever she's all like that whole thing where she's like i love you and they're like telepathic dreaming Mm -hmm. and they have like the fucking shining and they're because he's like there's others out there and i just that whole thing when i was watching that i was like holy shit are you kidding me they're like i I can't I, i just that is insane to me and i love it and hate it at the same time do you know what got cut what uh, so they were supposed to have this like love scene in front no. of like a yeah in front of a blue screen where they like make love across the world like they'll they like uh they'll they, they were like in front of a blue screen they like would like float and find themselves at the beach and find themselves at the mountains find themselves like I would on have Everest lost my mind 
Yeah, and they, they they cut it because it just they couldn't get it to work, and I was like, it just sounds like a bad idea to begin with. That's probably why it didn't work. Yeah. Awful. I have goosebumps. Like I'm cringing so hard just oh thinking God. about that. Yeah. Now, Thank I God that could have worked with the Reggie and 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 Kemi <laughs> scene. If you did that, like that would have been amazing. She's just like <laughs> riding him across yep. the universe, yep. and just yep. like I love your head. Maybe they're doing it while riding a unicorn, just <laughs> oh like God, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god yeah the the love scene between the love angle between mike and liz is probably one of the things that doesn't really yeah. it, not even it, it doesn't work at all in this movie it's, it's just not awkward. needed like no, even yeah. if they had like this weird like shining connection mm-hmm. like cool but oh god like she's like literally been like known him for like 20 minutes she's like i yeah. love you and he's like i love you too we're dreaming together yeah, they, they like kiss the moment they actually meet yep. yeah. Yeah. in a grave right like that's yeah. oh yes in yeah. a grave yeah. yep as one does normal you know, as one totally does and weirdly um, not as goth as you think it would be no it's no it's not. Um, i still don't know what's more awkward though like that or like the opening like love scene in the first phantasm where they're just like laying on top of each other mm-hmm. and like that's also quite awkward i don't know i don't think don coscarelli knows how to shoot love scenes like i would like to tell you it gets better it's not <laughs> going to get better his um <laughs> So, yes or no, has Don Coscarelli ever touched a boob? Yes or no? I'm going to say yes, but maybe he just doesn't feel comfortable. Okay. (laughs) Evidence says otherwise. I, I, you know, I would say, like, at least with the um, love scene in the first Phantasm, like, that kind of looks like a lot of, like, early 70s, like, adult film. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't, it wouldn't feel out of place. Like, it's shot in that style. This is just, I don't know what's going on. I mean, two of them are like <laughs> lying in bed, fully clothed. Like this is just, that's weirder than being naked. Like lying in bed, like being totally like, I think his sneakers are still on. Just You're like, not even under the blanket. No, it's like, it's I don't know. It's super hard. awkward. And like, she was going to have a line. I was like, I guess you can't have any safer sex than that or something. Cause it was mm-hmm. all going to be like astral plane sex or something. So like. Yeah. Will they have an astral baby or something? In the, I don't you know. know. I don't know. The, oh, the dream uh, child. Their own dream child. Yeah. <laughs> so I do. What I do like about the end of the movie is when, like, Kemi peels off part of her face. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you get like that is an awesome effect. And I know they tried to shoot it so that, like, they really tried to get it so that Kemi's face would be on Michael and on Angus Scrim. And he would peel it off and reveal himself, but oh. and they tried shooting it and tried shooting it um, like about a month before the movie was to be released. They really wanted to get it to work, and like Angus Scrim is like, this isn't fucking working. Like it just looked <laughs> really terrible. Um, it looked like more like someone was half melted and really cheesy. So, um, yeah, you know, I do like that effect at the end that I think you could have just had like. The her striving off. You don't even need that closing line of like, although it works like it is. And it's in the trailer for the movie. Um, they didn't want to give away the end. So they, they for the trailer, just shoot it in the mausoleum. The whole like, it's just a dream. Like, no, it's not like that's done in the uh, mausoleum for the trailer. So they don't give away the end. Mm. Um, but it overall, like that effect works. I just wish it didn't end on that kind of call back to the first of them getting pulled out again although i guess that's exactly where the next one's going to pick up so yeah that should be interesting oh um, i also noticed and i don't know if this is because i don't know if this was in the original theatrical version but yeah. i love a film when you can see the crew in the shot like that's always just like so sweet and endearing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but there's a scene when like the window gets blown open they're like oh they must have had a cat or whatever and then you see, like, off to the left, there's, like, clearly some dude's, like, arm, <laughs> like, his whole arm that. on yeah. the side of the screen yeah. that it's like, oh, yeah, that is, mm-hmm. that is a crew member, <laughs> like, standing, and like, a gaffer, like, I, standing by the light. Really just a problem for the widescreen version, because I think <laughs> when I caught it on VHS a thousand years ago, that mm-hmm. was not there. But I, That's what I was yeah. wondering. I was like, I'm not mm-hmm. sure if that's in like all the versions, but I love seeing stuff like that. It's just mm-hmm. so sweet when it's like, oh, yep, clear. That is nope. that is a boob mic or something. That, yep. <laughs> that's low budget filmmaking. And we leave, it leave it in. <laughs> all right. It's in the Any, movie. 
do you feel like speaking of low budget like do you feel like some of the charm is missing because there's more money in this because uh, when i finished it when i finished it this this time i was like i don't like it's cool that they have you know more money and they're like you can definitely see his creativity because you're right mike you see every dollar made but at the same time i'm still wondering if like the charm of that is missing I, I I don't know. That's uh that was when it finished this time. That was the thing I thought of. Like I feel like it doesn't have the charm of the first one. Yeah. I. Rachel, you go first. I think it's still there, but it's it's just a different kind of charm. Mm-hmm. Like I do think that the first one is like really unnerving and really beautiful and sad, and I yeah. think doesn't get enough credit for some of the ideas that it explores. And I think, I, I mean, I really like that movie. Mm-hmm. This one, I enjoy the same way I enjoy like Dream Warriors or something. Mm, like yeah. it's just a little, it's just wild. I think Reggie's presence is massive to mm-hmm. this one having that charm. Like if he was not mm-hmm. in it or if he had been recast, we're not talking about the same movie. Yeah. Like it would, it would, even if the tall man's in it, if the, if Reggie's not in it, it's not the same. So I do think that having him there makes it charming in a in a different way, in a more lighthearted way. I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I still get the feeling that this is a bunch of people running around playing make believe mm-hmm. when I watch mm-hmm. this movie, and they're having a lot of fun doing it. Um, and I get that mostly on the back of like Reggie Bannister's performance mm-hmm. of um, Samantha Phillips performance, like playing alchemy. Um, I just like those two in particular, I think like they're a lot of fun to watch together on screen, even though Phillips doesn't get a lot to do in this movie. Like she makes the most of every minute that she's actually on screen. Uh, and it's so ridiculous. Like the gore is so over the top, the weaponry, like again, you have a quad barrel shotgun in this movie that's used (laughs) for like one brief moment and then discarded the chainsaw scene. Everything is so it's kind of like the difference between evil dead and evil dead Two. Yeah. Um, I prefer the evil dead because of that low budget charm, but it's not like, Evil Dead 2 is a Marvel movie where Mm -hmm. everything is like behind a green screen and nothing feels real. Everything is still very tangible in this movie. And it just has such a, there's a goofiness to this movie. Absolutely. But there's also like a respect and a love. Like you can Mm -hmm. tell, I don't know, like it still feels genuine to me. Yeah. Like you mentioned Marvel and like, sorry, Marvel, like whatever. It's just the easiest go-to. It doesn't feel like soulless. Yeah, Like it still feels like there's a lot Mm -hmm. of people who really cared and were having fun and there was a passion and a point of view. So I do think that that is still intact. It's just different. It's just different. I think that's, I think that's probably where it's at. Cause Mm -hmm. when I finished it, I was like kind of wondering about it. I think you're right. I think it's just the charm is different, Mm -hmm. but it's still there. Yeah. And I think that's a great note to wrap up on. I think, yeah, I think that's a perfect way to kind of sum up this movie. So that is our, that is our discussion on Phantasm 2, which we hope you've enjoyed. And Andrew, if our listeners want to find more of you, where can they do so? Uh, They can find us at uh, deadlettermovies.com and pretty much anywhere you have, you look for a podcast, um, it'll show up. And um, the we're we're on Instagram, Dead Letter Movies. Um, we haven't the Twitter exists, but we haven't really been adding to it because, you know. Yeah. Um, so whatever wins that battle down the line, I'm sure we'll join that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, and you can follow me on on uh, what's it called? on uh, on Letterboxd. Um, that's just a Fabry, so a f a b r y. And yeah. what's I'll, the, I'll be your friend. What is the latest series you're working on on uh, ah. for Dead Letter Movie? Yeah, actually, when this is by the time this is up, hopefully, because I'm doing the doing the edit like right after this. Same. Um, yep. Yep. Let's race. <laughs> uh, <laughs> woo. Um, I we uh, me and some friends of ours from the Hair of the Werewolf podcast did a whole talk about fandom for 2022. Mm-hmm. So just the movies and the fan stuff that came out of that, um, and then we'll have we're going into going into award season, and so we're gonna start that stuff soon which is the thing here's the thing like i love and hate this stuff at the same mm-hmm. time this is like playoffs for me so it's kind of tiring but at the same time it's like and i'm not even saying these are going to be the best movies ever made either it's just fascinating to see how this 
happens yep. to me. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's, we're gearing up for that in the new year. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have that we're probably going, we're planning on going to a couple of film festivals, hopefully. So, yeah. and then we'll have a new series in the summer that we haven't figured out yet, but it'll happen. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. We'll definitely be checking that out. I'm looking forward to hearing that episode on fan. I think that's mm-hmm. always a, it's a fascinating discussion. I think it's mm-hmm. kind of to see how things have shifted a little bit and the really ugly side of fandom that unfortunately oh, yeah. exposes its head far too often. Yeah. Um, I, I asked the question of are Ghostbusters fans worse than Star Wars fans? And hmm. just, yeah, I don't have an answer, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd say yes, just because with Star Wars, I think Star Wars it appeals to such a wider swath of people Mm -hmm. and there's so much there uh, where like Ghostbusters feels like it's good as the first and the first movie is one of the greatest comedies of Mm -hmm. all time. It shouldn't inspire this kind of cultish devotion to it that it, it, it is really ugly side to it like to me the kind of ghostbusters fandom should be like caddyshack like yeah that's a great fucking movie you know like i'm gonna watch caddyshack again like caddyshack 2 exists but i don't care i'm just gonna watch caddyshack where ghostbusters fans are a different breed Mm -hmm. rachel how about yourself uh about ghostbusters no just just um (laughs) Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, uh, Twitter, I'm at vinyl girl, G R R R L and Instagram, the vinyl girl. And I'll be on the losers club next month for an episode. We're doing the Colorado kid, which will be really fun. And, uh, they, not me, cause I, it's too much, but they just wrapped up the dark tower, um, journey. So if you are a dark tower head, They've got some really great episodes um, wrapping up the final leg of that journey. And then, yeah, the whole rest of the year, we're just marching through the rest of some work chronological, um, chronologically. So that'll be fun over on Losers Club podcast. And as far as we go, for me personally, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter for now. Because again, like that feels, I feel about Twitter like I do about my 19 year old cat, like it's just, it's on its last legs. It doesn't really function nearly as well as it used to, but it just refuses to die. Um, so who knows? Um, but you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Mike underscore Snoonian. You can follow me over on Hive and Letterbox at Mike Chump Change. You can follow our site at Pod and Pend over on Twitter. I'm sure we'll do like a dedicated Instagram at some point three years, four years into the show, but you can go to our site, pod and the pendulum.com. We have all of our episodes and everything lined up really nicely on there. So it's a very easy way to go through the archive. It's also an easy way to leave a review. So we want to thank our listeners. Um, We are a little bit over halfway. Like I would love to get to 200 reviews and maybe apply for rotten tomato status for the show. Like that's our goal for this year an easy way to support the show, please rate review and subscribe to us. Uh, and you can go to the pod on the pendulum site, leave a five star review there and no we'll post on Apple uh, and everywhere else. And it really helps the show. We're going to update the patron page soon. We haven't done anything with that in forever. So we're going to retool it, put some new things up there for y'all um, and make sure to listen to my other show, psycho analysis, a horror therapy podcast where we cover horror movies through the lens of mental health. January, we're looking at COVID and the effects that it's had on our collective mental health. Rachel and I just recorded a show before recording this one with uh, (laughs) Jessica Scott, where we looked at the 2022 movie, The Harbinger. So that's a really good episode. Uh, That will be up in about a week after this one. So go ahead and check us out there. But that is it. That is our episode on Phantasm 2. Andrew, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. And listeners, we'll be back next time uh, with a new year and a new episode with Phantasm 3. And I believe Ari 
is going to join us again. She was on our first Phantasm show. So we'll be back shortly with that. Take care, everybody.